64-year-old Lisa Peltola is skiing across a desolate stretch of Arctic terrain on the border between Finland and Norway. It's close to midnight, and she can barely see a few meters ahead. Her new headlamp has proven utterly useless, and the thick haze has swallowed any slivers of moonlight, leaving her surrounded by pitch-black, frozen wilderness. It's been 54 hours of battling this relentless, unforgiving landscape. Bone-chilling winds, looming storm clouds, thick, swirling fog, and above all, endless, waist-deep snow. Every inch she moves forward feels like a fight against gravity, fading into a horizon that just blends into the sky forever. She can't stop. She can't feel the exhaustion seeping in. She can't think about the pain. What began as an exciting expedition has transformed into a desperate fight for survival. Somewhere behind her, sheltered in a snow hole beneath tarps and blankets, her 70-year-old husband lies semi-conscious in his sleeping bag, severely frostbitten, maybe even dead. She doesn't know. All she knows is that if she doesn't keep skiing now, they won't get to see each other again. This is their story. I know a lot of you, like myself, enjoy spending time outdoors, whether it's in the mountains, on the beach, or maybe like my wife and I, just a Saturday morning walk on a local trail. I constantly find myself looking for great ways to carry my drinks or snacks with me. Well, that's where today's sponsor comes in, Sparter. In particular, their insulated, leak-proof backpack. This backpack contains two insulated foam and leak-proof compartments. And whether you're carrying water, cans, fruit, or snacks, it can keep your items cool for over 20 hours. My favorite part about this product is the practicality. When my family goes on hikes, my wife and I are usually also carrying our son. So having a backpack that is comfortable, looks great, and also keeps all of our snacks cold for hours is necessary. And the Sparter Backpack does just that. To top it all off, it even has an attached bottle opener and side pockets for your phone or wallet. I personally use the 30 can capacity backpack, but if you need something a little bigger, they also have a 45 can capacity bag and at a great price point. So if you're in the market for a new outdoor pack or simply need something to help keep your food cold, just click the link in the description and check them out. It really is top-notch quality. Thank you again to Sparter for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the story. The intense two-day finale of the World Orienting Championship concluded in the breathtaking landscape of Aviemore, Scotland. From September 24th to the 26th, participants from around the world took part in grueling competitions, cutthroat rivalries, and nail-biting suspense in both individual and relay races. And at the end of it all, the big news was the crowning of that year's world champion, 25-year-old Lisa Valialainen. Not only did she take home the gold in the individual event, but she also helped her team snag a silver medal in the relay, marking a monumental achievement for Finnish orienting. For months after her incredible victory, Lisa enjoyed all the recognition and support she rightly earned from fans all over the country. But just when everyone thought she had enough of the limelight already, she revealed something that got even more people talking. Almost a year after her win, Lisa disclosed that she was actually four months pregnant during the championship. And while opening up on her experience, she explained how she struggled with severe morning sickness and nausea while getting ready for the event. To the world, it may have seemed like just another sports event, but for Lisa, it was the thing she loved most in her life. She'd first competed in the World Orienting Championships back in 1972, where she placed 40th individually and helped her team land 4th in the relay. Orienting, if you're unfamiliar, is a fast-paced outdoor sport where competitors use a map and compass to navigate from one point to another across challenging and unfamiliar landscapes. Unlike a fixed path, orienters get to choose their own routes between checkpoints, putting their map reading skills and split-second decisions to the test. The sport has deep roots in Europe and Scandinavia, going back over a century. Initially, it was used as a military training exercise in Scandinavia, but by the mid-1900s, it started catching on with civilians. And by 1966, orienting was officially recognized as a competitive sport, with the first championship soon following. 
Over the years, it's evolved and expanded across the globe, with versions for different terrains like mountain biking, foot races, and even ski orienting. Before 1993, however, it was primarily limited to individual and relay races, making Lisa's early experiences even more unique as she competed in a sport that was still evolving. Yet, exactly 12 years before making history as Finland's first orienting world champion, Lisa didn't even know how to read elevation lines on a map. Born in 1951, she grew up with a love for the outdoors that defined her childhood. She was adventurous, determined, and full of energy. But most of all, she never gave up on anything she set her mind to. When she was 13, she and her brother ventured into the forest with a compass for the first time, and that's when her love for orienting truly clicked. And with the sport just starting to gain traction in other Nordic countries, it didn't take her long to realize that she wanted to go all in and pursue it professionally. However, it still took her almost five years of practice before she fully understood those tricky, nested curves on the map that seemed like a foreign language at first. In 1972, she was only 21 years of age when she made her debut at the Orienting World Championship, representing Finland. Things didn't go exactly as she hoped in the individual race, but she was super close to leading her team to Finland's first World Cup relay win. Now, while Lisa was naturally a tall and athletic woman, which gave her an edge in her sport, she didn't just coast on that. Her training regime was pretty intense. With her husband, Seppo Veljalainen, as her coach, she trained for days, often in rough swamps and rugged terrains, honing her skills and endurance. And when they could steal a moment away from their busy lives, the couple loved to spar on the judo mat, keeping their competitive spirits alive. Throughout her impressive career, Lisa scored a total of 16 gold medals and 6 silvers. Out of those golds, she snagged 4 at the World Championships, with 3 of them coming from relay events. But for Lisa, orienting was never just about competition. She always saw it as something she would carry with her throughout her life. She wanted to transform it into a civic skill instead of just being a sport. In her interviews, she'd often point out, even the berry growers don't dare to go more than a couple of hundred meters from the highway because they're afraid of getting lost in the forest. She really believed that orienting was a skill everyone should have, not just athletes. That's why, even after hanging up her competitive shoes, she couldn't stay away from the sport. She'd often go on solo trips, immersing herself in nature and recharging in the wild. And while those adventures would take a major share of her time, her personal life was just as eventful. Her once cherished and passionate bond with her husband eventually changed, and the couple ultimately parted ways. Yet for Lisa, this relationship journey didn't turn out to be as dry as she had anticipated. She'd soon find a new romantic interest in her old friend and teammate, Tuomo Platola. Tuomo and Lisa had known each other since 1969. But it wasn't until 1983, when they both joined the same club, that things really started to heat up. At first, they were just friends, but Tuomo couldn't help but catch feelings for her. The guy was a bit of a chicken, though, and never mustered up the courage to tell her how he felt. Despite being an athletic engineer and a multiple Jukola relay winner, Lisa's adventurous spirit intimidated him a little. He would often joke that she reminded him of Pippi Longstocking with her wild energy. Still, they had a blast together, going on trips and hanging out, but it took them decades to finally admit their feelings for each other. Then on February 29, 2012, right before midnight, Lisa took the plunge and proposed to him. They tied the knot later that same year. However, the newlyweds didn't change up their routines much. Even though Lisa was 61 and Tuomo was 67 when they got married, they still kept their love for skiing and orienting alive while juggling their work to make a living. For the next three years, things went on like this until March 2015 came around. The couple was finally ready for a long overdue trip to Lapland, which is Finland's northernmost region bordering Sweden, Norway, Russia, and the Baltic Sea. Their expedition was set to last four days, where they planned to navigate through rocky slopes and rugged mountainous terrain, while stopping at various checkpoints along both sides of the Norway-Finland border. And while they were experts at their craft, and even had visited this area before, this time, the weather was shaping up to be the biggest hurdle. 
Sitting pretty much entirely above the Arctic Circle, Lapland is notorious for its harsh snowfall in March and April. Temperatures can plunge to a bone-chilling 21 degrees Fahrenheit to 9 degrees Fahrenheit, and the biting winds can make it feel even colder, creating dangerously low wind chill factors and terrible visibility during snowstorms. And because of that, they can only expect about 10 hours of daylight during that time of year. However, Lisa and Tuomo weren't the kind to let a few worries get to them. On Sunday morning, March 29th, 2015, they woke up bright and early before the sun came up and chowed down on breakfast, getting their energy up for the adventure ahead. They packed all their gear, loaded up on skiing equipment, thermal clothes, insulated jackets, and waterproof boots to handle the frigid temperatures. They made sure to bring plenty of high calorie food and navigational tools to tackle the harsh conditions ahead. Once all that was sorted, their first leg of the adventure was a two-day drive north to Lapland, covering about 745 miles from their home in southwest Finland. While the exact starting point is a bit of a mystery, it was roughly 7.5 miles from Lusijärvi Valley, which was their planned first stop. They reached the starting point at around 4 p.m. and hit the trail on foot. The trek to Lusijärvi was expected to take about three to four hours, and if the weather played nice, they should have arrived there by around 7 p.m. Lusijärvi Valley is a popular spot for hikers seeking shelter from tough weather conditions during their expeditions to the Arctic. Along with essential gear and basic medical help, this area is known for an open wilderness hut called Atiotivat. It's part of a network of shelters run by the state, scattered all over Lapland, often found on remote trails. They give hikers a chance to rest or spend the night without needing a reservation. Typically, these temporary residences come with a wood stove, bunk beds, and some basic cooking gear, making them a must-have for anyone tackling the tough northern terrain. Best of all, they're free to use on a first-come, first-served basis. Lisa and Tuomo were counting on finding that hut to crash for the first night. What they didn't realize was that the weather they had downplayed earlier was about to turn into a nightmare they would remember for the rest of their lives. They clipped their skis with Tuomo taking the lead as they pushed out into the Arctic's vast white expanse. At first, everything felt like a dream. The miles slid by easily, and excitement pulsed with every glide. They wove through a forest of frozen birch trees, their branches heavy with ice that glistened like glass sculptures, making the whole scene feel like a winter wonderland untouched by the world. Every risk felt worth it, and for a while, it was pure magic. But about an hour in, things started to shift. The temperature dropped, and the wind's bite grew sharper against their cheeks. In the Arctic Circle, they knew how fast the weather could turn. One moment, the sky might be clear, and the next, a thick whiteout could descend. They were used to the unpredictability, so they kept going, not too worried, at least, not yet. Ahead of them, the flat land was coming to an end, leading up to a steep slope that they need to climb to continue up the mountain. With the wind picking up as they gained altitude, they had to move sideways along the slope, keeping their skis firmly against the icy surface to prevent sliding backwards. It took them twice as long as expected to reach the top, and by the time they finally summited, exhausted after three hard hours, it was already 7 p.m. They should have been at the hut by now, but not only was the hut nowhere in sight, dark, heavy clouds had wrapped around them, making it impossible to see the way forward. Still, the orienter in them urged to press on, and the near total whiteout and dimming daylight, Lisa and Tuomo kept moving in what they believed was the right direction for nearly another hour, expecting the hut to appear at any moment. But the white just stretched endlessly into more white, until finally, they couldn't see anything at all through the darkness. This is when they realized the worst thing possible in that huge frozen landscape their compass was malfunctioning. Not only could they not figure out which way to go, but there was a fair chance they'd been off course right from the start. And with visibility reduced to nothing, their only guide was that faulty compass, which could have been malfunctioning for who knows how long. Now, as they glanced at their map, it all felt out of sync. 
They tried using their GPSs, but it had lost reception, leaving them stranded without a single working navigation tool in the remote, high-altitude wilderness. For most people, panic would be a given at this point, but not Lisa and Tuomo. They'd faced a lot of intense situations before, so they were pretty sure they could handle this when the visibility got better. Right then though, their only move was to hunker down and wait out the long night. As they decided to set up camp, they realized they hadn't packed any snow shovels because they didn't expect to be camping on ice. So they ended up spending nearly half an hour digging a snow cave with their skis and bare hands, just big enough for both of them. When inside, Tuomo stretched a waterproof tarp over the cave's narrow entrance to block out as much snow and wind as possible, then layered another over their sleeping bags to help trap body heat. Lisa quickly drifted off, but around midnight, Tuomo woke up, feeling the damp chill of a sleeping bag iced over from the condensation dripping from the ceiling. While Lisa managed to get a decent rest, he lay there, trying to ignore the noise of the wind and snow pelting the tarp above. And by morning, Tuomo was stiff, sore, and still exhausted. The night hadn't done much to ease his fatigue, but with no choice but to push on, they decided to take a quick meal before setting off again. Tuomo, once again too worn out to eat much, settled for some instant coffee, while Lisa had bread and cheese to keep her strength up for the long day ahead. At around 8 a.m., they finally poked their heads out of their cave and noticed that the wind had calmed down a bit. The sun was rising and visibility was pretty good. Since they couldn't rely on their compass anymore, they decided to head east using the sun as their guide. They believed that if they stayed on the right path, they would eventually come across the massive reindeer fence that marked the border between Finland and Norway, where they hoped to find someone to help them. And even if they didn't, all they had to do was follow that fence to reach Losujärvi Valley and their hut. On paper, that was the right move, but they had no idea just how far off course they had already wandered by that time. They were trapped in a valley about 23 miles from where they were supposed to be. And while this was one of the two paths that could get them to Losujärvi, it was the longer and way more dangerous one. The valley was all over the place, rising to the southeast and full of jagged rock ridges, which made it super hard to escape if you didn't have a good sense of where you were. However, completely unaware of the trouble, they set off again, with Lisa taking the lead this time. They cruised along for a few hours, but as the weather started to turn, Tuomo felt the alarm bells ringing. He kept shouting and whistling for her to slow down. Sometimes she would hear him, but other times the wind would drown him out, and she'd just keep going, until she realized she had left him behind and sprinted back in a panic. Tuomo was really struggling. Every step felt like torture, and he had to stop every few meters to catch his breath, leaning on his knees and hanging his head in exhaustion. At one point, he even tumbled down a slope, and Lisa had to ski over to help him. She took off his helmet and skis to lift him back up and helped him relax, at least for a little bit. With all that going on, they skied on a mix of ice and snow for hours, until once again, nothing made sense on the map. Still, they continued under the moonlight, but soon enough, they were so exhausted that they couldn't move anymore, deciding to call it a day and spend another night in the snow. Once again, they dug out some snow to make a little cave for themselves and settled in. For dinner, they ate some snacks, but their water bottles were frozen solid. Somehow, they managed to melt some snow using their almost empty burner for a bit of hydration. This night was even colder than the last, and neither of them could get any decent sleep. To make things worse, Tuomo started shaking uncontrollably and slipped into a semi-conscious state. The next morning, he found himself utterly trapped in his sleeping bag, unable to muster the strength to get out. Still, he forced himself into his skis for one last attempt. But as they both set off, after every few minutes, he had to stop and catch his breath for a long time. On top of that, the relentless whiteout made everything a blur, and he kept losing his balance, falling over again and again. It felt like trying to walk with his eyes shut. One moment, the ground would be flat, and in an instant, it would pitch downward, sending him tumbling if he wasn't steady on his feet. As the hours dragged on, his physical exhaustion began to morph into mental confusion. He'd hear a helicopter, 
and the distant sound of a motorcycle with a sidecar, struggling to convince himself that motorcycles didn't ride in such rugged terrain. They pushed through like that for almost 12 more hours, until nearly 7 p.m. when Tuomo finally told Lisa he couldn't go another step. They took a quick 20 minute break, but Lisa realized if he pushed on, he might just drop dead before they got anywhere. She figured the hut couldn't be too far now, so she decided to leave him behind to wait while she went to find help. She thought it would only take a few more hours to reach the hut, but once again, it was a complete miscalculation. Instead of wasting time digging another snow cave, she helped him into a sleeping bag, covered him with a tarp, and got ready to head out alone. But with visibility getting worse, she was scared she might not find him again after getting help, especially since they'd been trying to reach their first stop for three days, when it was supposed to take just a couple of hours. So to leave some kind of marker, she stuck to almost skis into the snow vertically and hung her flashlight from the tip to act as a beacon for her return. After spending almost an hour getting her husband all set up, she decided to hit the slopes again around 8 p.m., but it took her another hour of skiing around to realize she was just going in circles. Worrying about her husband, she figured she should head back and check on him, but on the way, the lamp she'd left to light the way had died. Maybe the battery gave out, or maybe she was just heading the wrong way again. All her tracks were now buried under fresh snow, and not only had she lost her husband, but she hadn't found the hut either. After another half hour of searching in all the wrong places, she thought it might be better to just camp out for the night and keep looking in the morning. Another day had gone by since they had gotten stuck in this situation, and now she was alone, wondering if Tuomo was still alive, or if he had already succumbed to the snow. Lisa spent the whole night questioning her choices. The next morning rolled in with a heavy feeling in the air. If she didn't get help by the end of the day, it wasn't just her husband who was definitely going to die if he wasn't already, but there was also a high chance that she might end up dead too, all because of the activity she loved doing the most. Time was running out and she was staring down two tough choices. She could either head back to check on Tuomo or keep pushing forward to find the hut. If she turned back, even if she found him, there wasn't much she could do to help. They could end up stuck together, which wouldn't help anyone. On the flip side, if she kept looking for the hut, there was a shot she could get help for both of them. It was a hard call, but deep down, she knew going forward was the right move. So she steered herself and chose to keep going. It was morning and the visibility was looking way better. Off in the distance, she spotted a mountain slope and luckily there weren't any clouds around to cause a whiteout. That meant if she could get to the top and see clearly, she might actually spot the hut from up there. She munched on some crumbled cookies she had stuffed in her pocket and skied up the mountain as fast as she could. Thankfully, she made it just in time and to her surprise, there it was, the hut sitting way out in the middle of nowhere. A huge wave of relief hit her as she took note of the direction, realizing she could reach it in just a couple of hours. Feeling pumped and more determined than ever, she set off again around 9am, and exactly two hours later, she spotted the hut peeking through the snowy haze. That moment was something she would carry with her for the rest of her life. At first, she noticed there were no vehicles or people around, but there were various footprints outside the hut, which meant someone had to be nearby. So she decided to head inside and wait for whoever it was to show up. After more than an hour, a Norwegian-speaking reindeer herder pulled up on a snowmobile. He introduced himself as Ole Thomas Ball in his best broken Finnish and asked if she was alone. Despite the language barrier, Lisa managed to explain that her husband was still out in the direction she came from and he needed help immediately. Ole stoked the fire, shared some food with her, and then hopped back on the snowmobile to search for Tuomo. After riding into the dead white wilderness for several minutes, he finally found Tuomo draped in a tarp and almost buried in the snow. At first glance, it looked like he was gone, but when he checked his heartbeat, there was still a faint pulse. He quickly called emergency services, who dispatched a helicopter to come and rescue them. It took another half hour before Tuomo and Lisa were finally rescued, after almost 70 hours, and attended by medics, but by that time, 
Tuomo's body temperature had dropped to just 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Due to severe and prolonged hypothermia, he was diagnosed with an acute circulatory disorder in the intestines, kidney failure, breathing issues, frostbite, and circulatory problems in his ankles, feet, hands, and arms. Each of these conditions was life-threatening on its own. The ends of his toes were black, skinless at the base, and red, resembling a peeled shrimp. At the hospital in Norway, doctors started the slow process of bringing his body temperature back to normal by circulating his blood through a warmer and injecting it back into his body. Miraculously, he began to show signs of recovery in about a week and a half, but they had to amputate all of his toes and also remove a three foot long piece of frozen intestine from his body. Lisa, on the other hand, only suffered frostbite in her thumb, but thankfully, it wasn't serious enough to require amputation. Tuomo eventually made a full recovery and took his time dealing with post-traumatic stress and getting used to life without his toes. Once nearly dead in a vast, unforgiving expanse, alone and helpless, buried under the snow, Tuomo came back to life and eventually passed away at home among his loved ones on August 18, 2021, at the age of 75. Reflecting on his traumatic experience, he would humorously recall how he had complete faith in his strong and resilient wife that she would find a way to get them both out of their predicament. He'd say, I thought that when I fell asleep tired enough, Lisa would come back with a solution. We were committed to this together. I take care of sleeping, Lisa takes care of the rest. Then he'd pose a thought-provoking question. If you don't know where you're starting from, and you don't know where you're going, can you find your way there? Tuomo would answer it himself. Lisa can. It was a miracle.